can we do with uh, harvesters and what can we do with uh, sorting equipment in the future? Uh, so we'll go into the, uh, the first speaker here this afternoon in this uh, sensing session. And uh, the first title is Spectral Imaging Applications for Harvest Quality Assessment. The speaker received his bachelor's degree in biology from UMass, University of Massachusetts, and an MBG, M MBA from uh, Northeastern. He worked for several large corporations uh, before co-founding Headwell Photonics in 2003, where he is CEO and president. Headwall is a leading designer and manufacturer of imaging sensors and spectral instrumentation that includes for the military, for uh, corporations, for medical, and, and agriculture. So uh, some of the uh, sorting equipment that we, we saw this morning had his sensors in it. Uh, let's give a round of applause to David Bannon. David. Thank you, Mike. Julie, you got me over there? You gonna help me out on this one? Okay, great. Um, I'm at a little disadvantage here because I am not from the blueberry industry. My, I have two points of reference, one of which is tramping through New England and, uh, and looking at some of the, the low-growing blueberry bushes. The other is uh, I usually dump a couple of blueberries into my yogurt in the morning. So that is my basis of uh, expertise. I, I think my real challenge here this afternoon is, and I'll read to you the email that Mike sent me and then you'll understand what I'm up against here. I have 12 minutes to inspire manufacturers and growers of the possibility of spectral imaging and blueberry mechanization. Okay, so I, I guess I gotta work on that part. And then his second request is let them know of the think tank approach of Headwall Photonics as they encounter new challenges that require sensing. Um, I can certainly try to do that. I think part of the, my issue is that uh, the think tank approach is probably a little inaccurate. We're not a research company. Uh, we're a small technology manufacturing company out of Massachusetts. So um, with that size and scale, it's really important for us to deliver solutions to our industry partners um, that work. That, robust, that are robust, that are reliable, that actually provide some cost benefits, some financial justification to their business. And that's really kind of been the focus. Um, the other kind of interesting thing about today's meeting is, I gotta tell you, I am so surprised at the number of people who have actually mentioned the concept or the phrase hyperspectral imaging or spectral sensors. I, I can tell you, it wasn't too many years ago that I would, put one of these hyperspectral imagers on a table at a conference, and it was like Daryl and Daryl and the transmission. You know, we just ain't never seen one of those things before. But now we get five people speaking about hyperspectral imaging, spectral sensing, questions on spectral and spatial resolution, and I think it just points to how far the industry has come in moving from the military defense environment to uh, commercial applications within the precision agriculture field. Um, how many optical PhDs out there, Paul? You don't have to raise your hand with that one. Are there any? Okay. That is our challenge as, as a technology company. We have spent so many years kind of developing a hardware software platform for the hyperspectral imagers. Um, really what we spend our time on these days is engineering out the complexity of the product set so that I don't have to ship an optical PhD person out with every piece of equipment. So a lot of our focus as we build this technology and build this technology uh, these solutions is to really engineer that complexity out to make it really easy to interpret, to understand for that concept of generating actionable information. So I'll show you a little bit of, of what we're doing today. Um, 
And Rod, I want to thank you for the, uh, for the invitation. It was a couple months ago you sent that out. And I was looking at it, and I'm like, Kai Bush Blueberry Conference, Salt Lake City. And, um, and I'm really glad I came. I'm really surprised at the number of Headwall customers that are in the room, Headwall partners, Headwall, Headwall collaborators. And uh, so thank you for pulling it together. Hopefully we can uh, be invited back next year. So a uh, couple of things, as, uh, as was mentioned earlier, the company's about 15 years old. They pulled it out of a much larger Fortune 100 company, uh, Agilent Technologies. I'm sure everyone from uh, SoCal is familiar with Agilent. Uh, we're about 65 employees, and we really focus on three particular industries. Uh, the military defense, which is where a lot of the spectral imaging work came from uh, initially. Uh, the remote sensing world, so that's a lot of kind of traditional precision agriculture. Um, and then uh, advanced machine vision. And so those are all very related, but really what we do is we build spectral imaging solutions that are robust, that can withstand um, those particular environments. We focus on uh, military defense. Those are the early days. That's where really where a lot of the stuff that, uh, that we did when we first started the company. Um, a logical extension from the military defense world was civilian uh, airborne activity, and that's the remote sensing world. Um, a lot of this, I'd like to say, it was a great strategic uh, decision by the company to move into remote sensing, but a lot of it was because, you know, there was that sequestration issue, you know, 10 years ago with the government. So we found that we had all of this great hardware software capability, you know, what do we do with it? And that's when we really started leading the commercial effort into remote sensing, precision agriculture, crop disease, and those types of areas. And a logical extension of that was really, okay, you're scanning the fields, you're acquiring spectral data, you're developing uh, plant vigor maps and things like that. You know, how does that relate to um, machine vision and specifically harvest quality and, uh, and optical sorting? So what we do, and I was interested uh, to note that Rod had mentioned in his presentation, you know, a lot of people haven't seen or don't know what a, what a hyperspectral sensor is. Um, what we do in our core forte as a company is we design these beautiful little diffraction gratings here. And what these things do is they actually take light into the sensor and they spread it into its respective wavelengths. So what we're doing is we're picking up or we're, we're visualizing a scene based not only on kind of how it looks to the human eye, but based on the chemical composition. Because what these diffraction gratings do is they'll look at the scene and they will split all the energy, all of the light into its respective wavelengths and we will measure that. And when we measure that, what these sensors do, it, you can think of it as just a regular camera, essentially. Um, light goes into it, the light is diffracted into its respective wavelengths, and then we record the intensity values across that whole electromagnetic spectrum. Um, in this space, or at least in the, um, the precision agriculture space, really what we're looking at is uh, the visual you know, 400 to 1,000 nanometers, uh, vis visible near-infrared. Some of the people this morning talked about near-infrared, and that's a really important wavelength, and some, there's some opportunities there that we can talk about. Um, but what we're, what we're really doing here is we're just kind of breaking that light out. We're capturing the, the relative intensities, as I mentioned. We do it from the UV into the visual near-infrared, into the midway, into the short-wave infrared, and into the midway. Um, the reason why we do that is because what we're trying to do is we're trying to detect the, the chemical fingerprint of the objects within the scene. So everything within the scene has a unique chemical spectra associated with it. So what these sensors do is they will look at a scene and they'll make a material identification decision based on how these things absorb or reflect these different wavelengths of light. Um, so for example, um, Blueberries have one spectral signature. One species of a blueberry will have one spectral signature. The next species will have a different type of signature. Citrus products will have their own unique signature. Weeds will have their own unique spectral signature. So what our sensors are doing are actually capturing that information, making a decision as to what those objects are in the scene, and creating a, an actionable map that says, hey, we want to put some sort of um, herbicide or pesticide on it. We want to understand whether there's crop disease in the field. And that's really kind of what we're, we're doing with this capability. 
To give an example, because this is, this is an older example, but I think it really uh, typifies and explains what we're doing with these uh, sensors. So if you look at the top left, you've got a, um, an ammo dump and it's got some Saab camouflage over it. So naturally, camouflage is, is designed to kind of blend into the background so you don't see it. So visually, it's not apparent. If you look at the lower uh, graph, what you're seeing there, that's kind of what it looks like if you fly over that scene. Everything looks the same in that scene visually anyways, but chemically, that ammo dump and that netting is a different chemical makeup, it's a different chemical composition. So if we know what the signature of that is, we're able to just bring that out from the background. So that's really kind of what we're focusing on is something that we refer to as a spectral anomaly, okay? So something that's chemically different, we don't care what it kind of visually looks like, but it's chemically different, and because it's chemically different, the sensor's gonna capture that information, and we can decide what to do with that. Is it a big deal? I mean, it's kind of a big number up there, given the fact that a few years ago there wasn't, uh, there wasn't a lot of focus, there wasn't a lot of understanding on the hyperspectral business. Um, I don't know if that's the right number. I think the last one I saw was 26 billion, but I don't think it's that large, but it's a pretty significant piece of technology. And if you look at that pie chart, you know, food processing and agriculture are a really significant part of, of uh, that addressable market size there. So what that means is that this technology is growing, the applications and how it gets applied uh, to agricultural operations and precision agriculture is becoming an increasingly important part of uh, our business and part of your business as well. So I, I just, um, I didn't initially intend to talk about the precision agriculture piece. I don't know if that's a, an overused topic for a lot of people in the, uh, in the room, but really what, what we're doing here is we're we're taking a little different approach to precision agriculture. Um, there's a lot of standard types of maps that I, people see these types of spectral maps relative to NDVI or enhanced VI and things like that. Um, I'm assuming that this is typically what you see when you have people come out and they fly, they do manned aircraft or they fly UAVs over your land. It's mostly a multi-spectral offering is what I think you're seeing is kind of the state of the industry, which means you're only looking at, at four particular spectral bands. Um, but, what, but our approach is really to, to make this a, a more accessible technology to growers and to agricultural entities. Um, the focus here is on invasive species. The focus is on really on crop disease, which is a really um, important economic uh, application for us because crop disease is a hyperspectral application with huge economic um, uh, downturns for, for people. And what we do, um, I don't know whether uh, blueberry crop disease is an issue, but just doing a little Googling research, anyone from Maine here uh, with the mummy berries? Um, this isn't your quote, is it? <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, but I, I mean, I, I always, when I go into these applications, I always try to understand kind of what are some of the key drivers and crop disease for most of the ag agricultural applications have, are, are just huge. And whether this is the right number or not, you know, if you're impacting crop yield by 36% um, because of crop disease and you have a technology such as a hyperspectral sensor, which, um, can detect crop disease six to eight weeks before kind of it's visually apparent to, uh, to you and me walking through the rows is a, is a pretty economically compelling uh, sensor solution at least consider. So crop disease being a hyperspectral application is something that we focus on. And there is a process for determining that, um, which we can go through at some point. Okay, Julie, this is where I might need some help. So I, a lot of the focus that we talk about with um, it's really, the picture is really probably the most interesting thing. You guys have seen these things fly around. Um, but given kind of the, the price points of, of UAVs, uh, what we have seen is just this really huge business in flying these multi-rotor UAVs. They probably carry, I think, five kilograms. They'll fly for 25 minutes. On this particular one, uh, what we have is, uh, is our little hyperspectral sensor. It's 600 grams and uh, uh, with a LIDAR unit on there. 
Um, that seems to be a pretty nice package. And what we do is we actually sell that as a, um, as a single part number. And the reason why we do that, because as I mentioned earlier, what we're trying to do is engineer the complexity out of, out of these solutions. We don't want, you know, we used to just sell the sensor and then our customers would go out and be like, okay, what do I buy for a GPS unit? I don't know, just kind of get a good one and we'll write some code or something like that. They get that and then it's, well, what do I use for a UAV? And uh, I don't know, just find something that'll give you 15 to 20 minutes. And you do that for a couple years, that can't be me. Is it? Wow, okay. So the, the point of this slide, and I'm gonna be very succinct, the point of this slide is the fact that we're providing integrated solutions that allow you to map your fields at a very low price point. Um, and you can kind of monitor crop disease and invasive species. Sorry for my, my poor time management here. I guess I'm just having too much fun. Okay, so we're doing all this work in the field. We're capturing crop data, um, whether it's crop estimates of crop yield, crop disease, whatever. Um, now we want to bring that into the factory. We want to start talking about um, uh, harvest and sorting quality. I'll give you some examples of some applications that we're working on. Um, we do a lot in meat, whether it's lamb and down in Australia or, or poultry with, uh, with the USDA and, and the United States. We do an awful lot with nuts. Um, we do an awful lot with the cousin to blueberry being the, the cranberry, and I'll show you some applications there. Um, what we care about are, are applications that have um, some economic uh, implications for, for downtime or, or problems, that being food safety. Every time I read about some 12-year-old kid eating a piece of plastic in his Wheaties in the morning is a really good application uh, for our, our spectral sensing technology. And food quality, that is huge. Um, because that allows you to charge higher prices for your, uh, for your product if you're investing in your product and uh, kind of manage your supply chain. So I don't want to kind of spend any time with this one, but I can tell you that, you know, if you look at that, artic that, uh, that image on the left-hand side there, um, that scares the heck out of an awful lot of people who are doing quality assurance and engineering plant management in their factories. When they leave after the second shift at night and there's just such random subjectivity to, to hand sorting and, and, and grading, uh, that's a problem. So our vision is really to try to work with a lot of the people that uh, were up here presenting this morning um, to automate that particular process so you get a very consistent measurement and, uh, and grading algorithm applied. Um, what we do here in a machine vision environment for grading and quality assessment is um, we put our sensors at a number of different control points, but the big thing is um, we're not just dropping a sensor above a conveyor line to do spectral grading. That doesn't do you any good if you find bad product there. So what we've really spent an awful lot of time doing is working with downstream ejection devices, um, and we will transmit that particular um, spatial position to a robotic arm or an air knife. I'll show you a couple of different um, um, applications of that. Uh, the key thing is the applications uh, or the algorithms that we develop, that is a high level of collaboration with the growers and with the processors. That defines your product quality assessment right there. Um, I think the gentleman this morning talked about hand quality is the definitive measure of, of or hand sorting is the definitive measure of, of quality. Well, we're trying to automate that particular process there. So a couple of things. I'm not going to play this video, Julie, but um, this is a line of, of 12 different people kind of sorting almonds and walnuts and things like that. Um, this is kind of a nightmare from a cost perspective, from a consistency perspective. Are you going to give me a 15-minute beep? Or? Okay. So, so when I talk about developing algorithms, what we're trying to do and when we work with you, and this is kind of the state of the industry these days, is what we're doing is we're helping you to define and create libraries that identify your... Um, your vision of what a quality uh, product looks like. High grade, low grade, I think it's ABC and juice. Is that the way we do it in this industry there? So we work with you to define all of these characteristics so that if you, um, can you hit this one? So these are, these are some nuts. But we go from that extremely kind of manual hand sorting environment to a situation where these are almonds, and uh, I think we do most of the almonds in California in terms of processing. But our sensor's hanging above the line. That is our illumination there. So illumination is like the secret sauce in any of this um, selection. And we've got this FANUC robot that we work uh, very closely with that's doing three picks a second. So we've created 
based on your concept of quality, what a good product is, what a bad product or, or defect is, and what we're doing is we're picking off the line. And I don't care whether it's a FANUC robot, I don't care whether it's an air knife or a clamshell, um, you know, it all depends on your particular uh, environment there. So when I, look at, um, when I look at some of the work we do with vineyards and actually um, the gentleman from Texas A&M, we're actually uh, scanning about 1,000 or 1,100 vineyards over Napa Valley right now and, and generating um, spectral maps relative to crop disease, uh, crop disease and leaf roll virus and things like that. But um, one of our customers is a uh, uh, blueberry manufacturer in Massachusetts. And um, eight weeks out of the year, they get these 18-wheeler trucks literally kind of miles down the road trying to grade their harvest. The state of the industry is, and perhaps this is a gross simplification, but it, it's not too far away. Um, you get a seasonal hourly worker jumping up at the scale house into the back of that truck. They literally take a scoop. They try to get down as far as they can, but that's going to be about two feet down into that mix. They're going to take up this little scoop. They're going to dump it in a tray, and they're going to sort through it, and they're going to say, oh, you, get a, you got some leaves here, a couple of sticks. You got some greens. You got some yellows. I'm going to give you $2 for this batch. Um, so there's really no differentiation in terms of um, the quality and certainly not a lot of uh, high volume uh, scanning going on here, sampling going on. So what we've done is we've implemented um, uh, conveyor systems where as these trucks pull up to the scale house, what they do is as a probe goes in, we suck a couple hundred pounds out uh, from the load. And what we immediately do is we scan those in terms of healthy berries, um, the amount of rot, um, the amount of foreign material in there. We're able to provide them with a, a color analysis chart because, as you know, the color is an indicator of, of kind of the anthocyanin content and, and the quality, size analysis, and they're able to right there give to the grower a report that says, ah, we're paying you $2.50 for this batch because of these qualities, and that farmer can take that back to the bog and say, okay, we got to do something different or we got to do similar things like that. On the other hand, somebody who's not investing, and this is a neighbor, this is a, uh, a weekend project or hobby for them, hey, you're not really doing precision agriculture, you're not really investing, so we aren't going to pay you the same amount of money as we are the people who are, who are putting a lot of time and effort and investment into the field. Um, Key thing here is when so we're capturing all that information, if you look at that particular business, they need a particular quality of berry in order to drive their profit margin, okay? Because you know some of the stuff goes for juice, the other stuff goes for jellies, but the, most of their margin is being generated by the sweet dried fruit stuff. So if you're able to segregate your harvest and direct it to a particular processing line that is either driving your margin or driving price premiums, that's a really good economic situation for, for a lot of our customers. And this is literally, I, Monday morning, yesterday morning, I got up and I went into the refrigerator and I looked in that old clamshell and there's these things, blueberries kind of hanging around in the bottom, probably 10 days old. I said to my wife, do we have any different ones? I got a new batch and I was like, okay. I took, the, I put, I literally put these in a baggie. I took it to work and I asked one of the engineers just to kind of scan it, and um, because I wanted to see if we could tell the difference between good and bad and, and how gross or obvious it was. And Mike had sent me an email saying, hey, you know, right around 800, 800 nanometers is really kind of an evidence of maturity and anthocyanin content. And sure enough, we kind of start peaking right about 800 nanometers. So. Um, Foreign material is easy, right? That's something that's totally different from the fruit. You don't have to worry. Steel, plastic is much different than uh, chemical composition than, than the fruit. This stuff is relatively easy. Kind of run into a little problem or, or issue sometimes with uh, sticks and twigs because they take on the spectral characteristics of, of the fruit, but we apply a shape algorithm to that. So this stuff is, is kind of easy to do in real time. and. Uh, so when you look at kind of what we're looking at, um, hopefully we'll see blueberries on the salad that have been scanned with uh, some of the sensor technology. Um, like I said, we do a lot of, of uh, a Napa wine now. We do coffee. We do a lot of phenotyping, which I think we had a discussion isn't being done too much in the field, but that's an interesting topic for maybe next year. Um, thank you.
I know no one here needs to uh, evaluate their processed fruit and get a, a readout like that. That just isn't anything that this group would have any interest in, I'm sure. So, uh, well, I get a lot of calls on that subject. So uh, that is great, David. The other area is being able to identify one variety from another uh, as well as the weeds, but one variety versus another, and then uh, being a mapping that, and then go to any field and fly over and know exactly what's in that field. I think that's tremendous also. So uh, thank you again, David. The next topic uh, in the title is uh, Emerging Sensing Technologies for High-Value Crop Production and Loss Management. And uh, this speaker got his undergraduate, equal to undergraduate in uh, India, and uh, MS in Agricultural and Biosystems Engineering at Iowa State, and a PhD from the uh, same uh, uh, Agricultural Biosystems Engineering from uh, North Dakota State, and now he's at Washington State in the Department of Biological Systems Engineering. He's a core affiliate faculty member of the Center for Precision and Automated Agricultural Systems, uh, which is the same group that uh, Dr. Zhang is with, who uh, was in the previous panel. And uh, research and extension focus on scanning and automation technologies for site-specific and precision management of uh, production agriculture. Let's welcome Dr. Lav Knott. Dr. Knott? <laughs> Okay, my timer here. <laughs> Hi, folks. Uh, I have some cold, so bear with me for the next 12 minutes. Um, I'm uh, with the Academia, so I will speak independently. And the reason Headwall is saying that it's a $12 billion industry or million, a billion dollar industry of the hyperspectral sensing is because of the cost of the sensor, right? One of those things. Uh, anyway, so. Um, for today, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, the way um, the field of sensing is emerging, both optical and volatile sensing, and what we can do with this. Like, and similar to um, um, other uh, speakers, I don't have much uh, going on in blueberries, but I'm trying to give you know um, bird's eye view on uh, what these technologies can do for you in uh, high value crops like apples, cherries, and why. Uh, wine grapes and maybe blueberries as well, right? So my program at uh, CPAS, Washington State University, focuses on three things. Sensing, decision support, that is uh, uh, based on the data that is coming out of those sensors and doing something in return that is, you know, um, applying the crop inputs or chemicals, right? Um, I was told that this is sensing panel, so I'm going to just focus on first two aspects, sensing and the data decision support, right? So um, let's talk a little bit about advances in sensors, right? And I think my job is very easy here. Um, just look at your smartphone that you have in your pocket. Go back five years back and look at the same set or similar type of phone that you had in your pocket, right? How many of those were able to take high resolution 10, 12 megapixel images uh, that you can just you know, put on Twitter or something like that, right? So um, the field of sensing is changing very rapidly, right? In fact, most of the smartphones that, smartphones that you have in your pocket the company is selling you $700, $800 sensor, they are beta testing you so that they can have next best thing uh, that they can sell for $1,000, right? So um, um, just like smartphone, uh, think about when it comes to field, um, when you want to do field mapping and scouting and all these things, right? Um, go to um, uh, GoPro, right, and, and see they have $600 virtual reality um, camera or imager, right? You can just take it to the field, and you can see 360-degree field of you. Um, and as you go you walk in the field, you can just collect that data, um, uh, seamlessly stitch that data, and you have all the digitization that need to happen is done by that $600 sensor, 
right? Um, let's go to you know a little bit further uh, for the aspects that you know our eyes cannot see, right? A lot of those multispectral sensors that we talk about uh, that we use on the drones and, and on the ground, you know, they they see some um, factors, uh, the stress, radiation, and all these things um, that our eyes cannot see, and that you can use. Um, to tell what, you know, not what kind of stress, but what's going on in the field. Hey, there is, is there any stress that is happening at given location in, in that image, multispectral image, right? And then um, there's, of course, the, you know, and these sensors, what you see here, uh, the cost of those is somewhere from $2,000 to $6,000, right? Depending on number of optical bands that are there and all these things, right? Let's talk about hyperspectral. Uh, we had a previous speaker. Um, uh, they are like, you know, a thousand or, uh, not thousand, hundred or more spectras there, very high resolution uh, data that is coming out, hypercubes, right? And you can do a lot more things with hyperspectral. Uh, the issue that we have, and from the academia, is um, the cost of those sensors and data analytics. We are still not there in terms of, you know, putting this on drone and, and getting large acreage done and all these things, right? Um, think about um, other optical sensor. Um, you can practically go to FLIR website, and they have FLIR 1, it's a $200 sensor that you can buy attached to your, sm your smartphone, and you have a thermal imager that takes image of everything that you see that is thermal image, right? So from $200 to $40,000, uh, depending on the resolution and everything that you need, you can get the type of sensor that you need to get the scouting done, right? Uh, most of the drone sensors that we use, uh, thermal imaging sensors, they range anywhere between $2,000 to $6,000, right? But if you use those properly after, with right calibration and everything, and I have example in later slides, um, you can get crop stress assessment done uh, more to, towards the irrigation management uh, very accurately with those sensors, right? Uh, we can also do, um, you know, like terrain mapping and get the plant height and phenotyping and all these aspects get done uh, using this 2D or 3D LiDAR um, that can be, you know, put on the ground vehicle or the, uh, the drones, right? Um, there's also a lot of advancement that's happening, and this is to do with the online packaging, um, uh, online sorting things, right? Uh, we have done some studies, and there are a lot of you know, advancements that are happening in CT imaging. Uh, there are micro CT and a lot of other different types of um, uh, portable CT imaging techniques that are, that are emerging that you can use uh, to non-destructively look at the, um, your fruit and everything and identify the internal defects, right? Um, so, um, when it comes to platforms, when we have to put these sensors on the platform, then we have, we can use a four optic, where you have the sensor on the ground vehicle or in the hand, and you just go and scan the things, or you can have, like, fiber optic probe, where you just clip to the leaf and get the spectra, um, do the data analytics, and identify the stress, disease, or non-disease-related symptoms there, right? Um, you can also have your ground vehicles, as you are uh, have managing your, you know, farms or, uh, blocks, you can have the sensors gantry on those ground vehicles, and you can just real time collect the data without any additional input or any additional trips or scouting trips that need to be done there, right? Um, again, of course, we talk a lot about this, right? Um, last five, 10 years, uh, thanks to DOD cutting the funding, uh, we are seeing the, you know, a lot of drone companies uh, trying to enter in agriculture, uh, similar to sensor companies, right? Um, and then we have, you know, small, less than 55 pound uh, drones and um, Yama and some other companies that are mid-sized drones, uh, they can do a lot more things, right? As long as we uh, stay in compliance with uh, part 107, that is, you know, um, the FAA regulation, and uh, that allows most of the flights um, in our agriculture farms, right? Um, this slide is to tell that, you know, um, when we started talking about drones uh, a few years back, there's, there were several companies started talking about, hey, we have this platform, that platform, and so many platforms were out there. Like previously, if you go like a few years back to any expo, you will see several types of drone companies there saying that, hey, we have this drone. Soon we realized that there are not much optics that was there to put on these drones, right? And that's why I'm glad Hedwall is here. They're trying to miniaturize their sensor, hyperspectral sensor that goes on these drones. And, and several other companies then become, you know, they were trying to develop those sensors. Then we become from platform agnostic to sensor agnostic, right? But what really grower need is the data and the decision that comes out of the data, right? So um, there are some service providers that are trying to get into this business, and that's why you don't see many drone companies now trying to sell their drones to the growers, rather some service providers trying to you know, use this technology as they uh, provide the consultation and everything, right? But 
one point I want to make here is drone is not the solution for everything, right? Uh, look at the, 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 you know, why we, we started talking about Prishnag, because we, we have this constellation of satellites up in the air, like high orbiting satellites, right? Um, there are several other companies um, and in, in the US and Europe. We are launching low orbiting satellites that instead of getting data from 40 for every 14 days, we're getting data every other day now. And at the, from 30 meter resolution, we are going down to a few meter resolution, right? So instead of just thinking about drone is a solution for everything, think about how you can use the satellite data, high and low orbiting satellite data, and then use drone as one of those crop inventory or crop uh, scouting tool and then we have a solution than just buying a drone and sensors and just trying to you know, do everything with drone. Uh, that's the point I wanted to make here, right? And, and similar to you know, um, um, several other speakers that talked here, um, the applications of drones you know, is, is up to your imagination. You can do a lot more things, a lot more applications of those technologies depends on what kind of sensor you put on those, right? Uh, you can also use drones for um, uh, like surgical or spot spray applications, like what Yama is trying to do in California. Uh, we try to use Yama's platform to, um, uh, you know, um, we have, in Washington State we have sweet cherries, and so we have the issue with the fruit cracking, and so we try to use that to, you know, uh, fly low um, because we have some safety issues and all these things, and remove the water, rain water from those maturing fruit um, canopies, so that we ha we don't have splitting there. A colleague of mine, he's trying to use the drones to deter the birds and the blueberries and some other crops, right? So there are many other applications that you can do with the drones. The only thing is um, you need to do it meaningfully, right? Um, so um, I'm just going to have one application of drone, um, and then I'm talk going to talk about the ground sensing. Uh, this particular application is about saving water. So a colleague of mine, what he's doing is instead of, this is a grape, by the way, no blueberries, um, instead of dripping the water, on the surface, he's putting these emitters, he calls it subsurface microirrigation at different depths. And, and seeing that if we put the water at subsurface, can we save some water? At the same time, can we have, you know, do, can we do deficit irrigation and everything and grow better quality uh, grape, wine grapes to make better quality wine, right? Um, so on this project, what we are doing is, um, as you know, we are putting water at different depths and different rates, we are trying to use the drones uh, to look at the physiology. And the drone says then again, we are trying to use a multispectral sensor and thermal infrared sensor, right? Um, so we have found very good um, use of the drone technology here. Uh, this is a five band multispectral sensor that looks at visible and uh, near infrared um, uh, domain. Uh, what we did is we, we did three years of data, three seasons of data. Uh, we have this, what's called pressure bomb, or we, what we use it for is to get the stream water potential or get the crop stress, and then we use this. It's not a very handy tool. It, it takes a lot of time and everything. So we wanted to see, towards the end of this project, can we use drone technology to look at um, the thermal images, so the multispectral images, and say, hey, your wine is stressed at this location, or can you relate that stress to the berry quality and everything, right? So uh, you can see the graphs here. Uh, we had a very good correlation uh, between the, the multispectral imagery and the, um, the stomatal conductance that is measured as a stress factor, right? Um, the same thing with thermal imaging. With the right calibration, you can use thermal imaging to scout most of your field and, and get the stomatal conductance kind of you know, assessment uh, to understand the water stress in your field blocks, right? And I'm saying the right calibration because thermal imaging is a very tricky thing. And if you just take good quality images, then you have good water stress assessment done. If you don't get good quality images uh, without calibrating sensor and everything, your images are going to look colorful, but they are not going to be useful for doing anything. And that's the bottom line, right? We're also trying to use 3D LiDAR and, and 3D camera to map the canopies and look at the variation that's related to irrigation and everything. You can do something similar in blueberries uh, to look at the, um, uh, the canopy variations. Um, I'm close to 12 minutes. Um, we are also trying to use drone 2D imaging um, and just you know map. Just this is a thousand dollar or less than thousand dollar sensor, um, RGB 24 megapixel uh, imaging sensor, and and reconstruct the canopies, right? And that you can use for doing several things. You can do um, a variable rate spraying. You can do variable or canopy management. Or everything that can be done by just re you know mapping these canopies effectively with just RGB imaging sensor, right? A um, little bit more, next two minutes I'll focus on um, 
we talked about hyperspectral sensor, right? Um, in my lab, um, I don't believe that farmer need to have this $100,000 sensor to do crop stress assessment, right? So what we are trying to do is use hyperspectral sensors, a spectral radiometer and hyperspectral imaging sensor, and develop some low-cost sensors. And here is one good example uh, where we are trying to use this SVC spectral radiometer and detect the fire blight. Um, the, the point is not can we detect or not with hyperspectral, we can detect, yes. Idea is to you know, identify those spectral bands in the lab, in the field, and tell the grower that, hey, we have these spectral bands that we can use to develop a sensor that might work in the field. And then with robust validation, then you can use such sensors for doing several things, right? Um, same thing we are trying to do with, um, and this is a blueberry-related project, uh, we are trying to use hyperspectral imaging to you know, non-contactly detect the damage of the, the birds due to uh, frost or cold, right? Um, uh, we are trying to do something similar, again, to detect the, the uh, it's called uh, leaf roll disease in grapes. Again, idea is to use the hyperspectral sensing, but then develop low cost, you know, two or three or four band sensor that you can use in the field um, uh, to, do, to do several things, right? Uh, there, uh, this is hyperspectral. Um, this is to do with the, you know, detecting the internal damage of the, the Honeycrisp apples uh, using CT imaging. And I wanted to have this example here so that, um, you know, there might be some industry folks here who can just take the CT imaging and make it online uh, packaging lines to do all these things there, right? Um, and we were very successful in terms of, you know, identifying where the bitter pit develops, how it develops, and can we detect this um, at um, you know, several storage um, uh, stages of the apples. Um, I'll skip that one. Uh, this, sli this slide is there um, to just talk about you know, other sensing, that is optical sensing. Just like our nose, we have you know, um, several different types of electronic nose, and if you go to the airport, there is what is called uh, ion mobile spectrometers. They can you know, swab your bag and uh, they can flag you, and hey, you have something there or you don't have anything there, right? Um, so you, there is a lot of advancements that are happening in this uh, technology, like volatile sensing, and you can use some of this um, uh, for um, uh, in the blueberry industry as well, is the example. And this is we are doing with potato. We have several issues with the rot, and we are trying to sense the, the, the volatiles with that, right? And so um, um, and that's just the flavor of the you know, uh, volatile sensing. Um, I will stop with this one. Um, you know, just like uh, blueberries and apples and any other crop, we have several issues with the, you know, the management, frost and several other crop loss management issues. The reason is we don't have good monitoring tools, right? And I want the industry here uh, to focus on, you know, uh, t looking at 5G and all these internet technologies now, um, develop some IoT sensors that we can put in the field. And we are trying to do something, but again, the challenge for all the industry, develop some technologies that we can have that are low cost and that we can use uh, to monitor the fields better so that we can manage it better. And I'll stop there, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Cotton. Uh, finally, a, a non-destructive way to measure blueberry bud damage or the possibility of it. So uh, that is good to hear. Our next speaker uh, topic is smart trapping with Spensa Technologies Incorporated. Uh, this speaker is from Naperville, Illinois, and uh, got his bachelor's degree at Ohio Wesleyan, and uh, PhD and master's and PhD from Purdue. Pretty good basketball team this year. Uh, uh, before joining Spencer, he worked on a number of pest management projects, including uh, smallholder farms in sub-Sahara Africa, uh, protecting from quite a number of pests. Uh, now at Spencer Technologies, he serves as the in-house expert on insect pests and pest management. Current research includes the use of remote monitoring traps. This would be a trap that recognizes the problem insect and could send an alert. 
Let's welcome Dr. Scott Williams. Scott. I've got it. All right. Well, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Dr. Scott Williams. You may recognize me as the guy running around in the hat. Um, it's a pretty good hat. Um, probably very nice for hunting. At least it makes me a very attractive target. Um, and I work as the in-house expert, as Dr. Mainland said, for Spencer Technologies on various pest-related issues. And while Spencer does not currently have much activity in the blueberry industry, we were excited about the opportunity to discuss with all of you where we could possibly help you find solutions to the various pest problems that you currently face. So, pressing, which button is it? Side button, yeah, I'm pressing it. Uh huh. No. Nope. Hmm. Huh. Can you do it back there, Julie? I can't do it. Either. You can't do it there. Okay. And it doesn't work there. No. Nope. <laughs> well, I can keep going if you would like me to. Okay, yeah, I can vamp a little bit. So we at Spencer Technologies know that you, ah, here we go, exactly what I wanted to get to. So we at Spencer Technologies know that you're constantly hit in the media with this mantra about being smart with the data that you have. That with all that information going in and out of your field, that if you're not being, quote, smart about it and making the best use, you're doing something wrong. But we at Spensa don't agree with that assessment. We know that the clients that we work with are smart and are trying to do their best. But what our focus is, is how do we make that stream of data more efficient so that you get to the decision-making step at a faster pace to better respond to what you're seeing in the field? We at Spensa are a team of engineers, agricultural professionals, and customer service personnel who share a vision that with the right tools, we can help growers get the best crops as well as the greatest return on their investments. And to do that, we have a number of options that we promote, including hardware as well as software options. And I'm just gonna be using my time to share how these technologies could potentially apply within the blueberry industry. So we at Spensa consider ourselves an in-season pest management company. And when you hear that word pest, perhaps what pops into your mind is one of many, many insects that affect your blueberry bushes. And if you're going to be dealing with insects, you're gonna to need to detect them, and that's gonna require a trap. Now, there are a number of trapping options out there, depending on the particular pest that you are focused on. You have your bucket traps, your wing traps, your delta traps, sticky cards for very small insects, and for certain crops, the heart stack trap is also an option. Now, these all have different, they all exploit different aspects of insect behavior and target different pests, but when you boil it down, they kind of work all in a similar way. You have to set up the trap in the field, and then you wait for the pest to arrive. But you're not watching that trap 24 hours a day. You have to visit it every so often, and you probably don't have the time to visit every day. So there's always gonna be a little bit of time that you have in between visits. Then there's also that time that it takes you or an employee to go out and actually visit that trap. 
And then there's that time where they have to count the insects to see how many entered the trap. And you have to hope that they actually know how to identify the pest, otherwise you be, could be missing important information. And then finally, they have to report that information for you to actually make a decision about whether or not there is a significant number of pests in your field. Do you see how that built up? That there were these little inefficiencies in time wasted that prevented you from making a strong decision faster. Our hardware products are trying to solve that, those small little steps of inefficiency. And they also help with dealing with other problems when it comes to trapping. Say that uh, you have a trap out and a storm blows through and completely destroys or causes that trap to go missing. Well, you've lost data. And that data is now going to prevent you from making a good, the next decision until you've set up a new trap and caught more insects. But these traps here, our Z trap and our new Sentinel trap, are designed to actually transmit wirelessly the data that they collect to your device of choice. And that's going to give you a quicker idea of what's going on without even having to visit the traps themselves. So to put, go into just a little bit more focus on the traps themselves, the first of the two that I want to talk about is our Z-trap. And this is the foundational product on which Sensa got its start. This trap here, and I'll get you guys a better look of it, is a remote sensing trap that uses a process called bioimpedance. Now that's a Big word, but it's actually a very simple process. The electronic enclosure at the top here has a battery that fun funnels a constant charge discharge cycle into electronic tines that you can see in the orange hut. And when an insect is attracted into the trap, either through a lure or some other attractant, it will tend to fly into or land on the tines, and that's gonna give it a nasty shock, just like a bug zapper and cause it to fall into the bucket at the bottom. Now, this discharge gives the insect a shock, and that doesn't just stun or kill the insect, but also causes a disruption in the discharge cycle that the trap had been going through. And the computer inside the trap actually will record this as a capture event and then upload that information up onto the server for you to access. So you can know in pretty well, real time, what is going into your trap. And if you are the careful and considerate grower and want to just confirm that you are catching what you want to be catching, well, we have the insects in the bucket for you to confirm when you have the time to actually go out and visit them. Now, we have already targeted a number of pests with the Z-trap, and we think that there are ones that are already compatible here in the blueberry industry with the Z-trap. We already work with cutworms and leaf rollers, and anything that's in an approximately same size is going to probably also work as long as there is a commercial pheromone lure. So your tussock moths, your cranberry fruit worm, and your cherry fruit worm are all likely candidates. But the Z-Trap isn't the only offering that we have at Spensa, and we're really excited about our latest product, which is the Sentinel Trap. And it offers a completely new way of detecting insects and getting that information to your handheld device. The Sentinel Trap, unlike the Z-Trap, is a camera trap. And to show you, Right in the center of the electronic enclosure is a camera that can take images at whatever interval you think is relevant for accurately detecting the pests in your field. And when it does that, it can actually identify using machine learning algorithms what in on that sticky card is your target pest versus something that you don't care about, like a leaf or maybe another insect that is completely harmless to blueberries. 
Even better, the machine learning algorithm can also determine whether something on that card was there the previous time a picture was taken or is a new capture. So you can see over time how the pest population is growing and landing on that card, giving you a better sense, is the rate increasing or is it maybe tapering off? Now, we think that the sentinel trap here could also be very useful for blueberry pests, but I say this with kind of a red flag, because we think that eventually we can target insects such as blueberry maggot, spotted winged drosophila, and other tiny insects, but one of the things that we are still working on is getting the resolution of the camera down to the point where these insects are gonna have these clear markings. We can see the insects on the card, but if you need finer detail than that, we ha still have a little bit of a ways to go, probably another three to five years. But there are also other considerations for the sentinel trap that maybe we haven't considered. And that's where I really would like to talk with you about what are other concerns for a trap like this that you could think of. Are there color considerations or should the trap be oriented, not horizontally, but vertically in order to make use of how the insects typically land? These are questions that we don't have the answers to necessarily, but I'm in a room of experts right now who could probably help me find the right solution to your needs. And while I've been talking about our hardware options, Spensa also provides a number of software options that could also help with your current production needs. And probably the first one that I can talk about is our OpenScout app. This is something I believe that you can actually use right now, today, and actually see a benefit. What OpenScout is, is an app that you have on your phone, and you, either you or your scout can go to the starting point of your route in the field, turn on the app, and begin walking. When you are walking, the app will trace a route on your path, and it will give you, back on your computer in your office, the opportunity to actually see where they are going and make sure that they are going through their appointed rounds. And as the scout is going through and sees a problem, such as mildew on the leaves or maybe some aphids, they can take a snapshot on their phone, answer a few questions relevant to that pest, and then send a report. And you can read that report almost instantly and get a sense of, hey, there's a problem right here. I need to contact someone to do something about it. And therefore, there it is almost cutting out a huge amount of time spent trying to get the information reported to you to make your management decision. And if you want something more out of OpenScout, we also have Insights, which takes that data collected through the OpenScout app and tries to make predictions based on it. Say you have an insect pest that has a certain rate of growth and want to see if it, is it going to get to a point where it's going to be a problem? Well, we have stuff like dynamic phenology, which takes the information and projects the population growth rate in your area. Or say you have a number of scouts or other employees that you need to send to multiple areas and focus on different tasks. Well, Precision Dispatch will also cover that and allow you to more effectively organize your workforce. And then finally, say you had, yep, yep. say you are really concerned about the weather and in agriculture, who isn't? Well, you can also look at our weather integration products that help you organize temperature and precipitation information, as well as look at degree days and chill hours that can be really have an impact on your crop. So as I wrap up this presentation, we have, I think, a number of products that could be a great benefit to the blueberry industry. 
But we also recognize that this is an area that we haven't really explored up until this point. And I feel that if we have a chance to communicate and find what the actual needs of the industry are, Spensa can design products that can be the that can serve a great benefit to everyone here. And I'd be happy to talk with you after the symposium. Thank you, and have a good day. Thank you, Scott. You're the only one that got it, got it done ahead of time. We have room for a question, if anyone has one. Yes? Are you working with the industry in any way? That's actually something that I've been trying to push for a little bit. Just hasn't been a focus right now. We need to figure out how to articulate policy. <laughs> Any other quick ones before? Uh, yes? Can you comment on the cost of those traps? So we offer different pricing models for the trap. The trap itself is around $300, but we do also offer packages that are based off of the acres covered, and therefore the trap becomes included in the cost of that. We use the commercially available lures, so the traps basically are replacements for otherwise commercially available pheromone traps. So if a pest already has a lure available, it's compatible with these trap types. Maybe we better go to our uh, uh, panel. Mm -hmm. While they're coming up, I just will make a comment. Uh, there was a Blueberry Mechanization Symposium 46 years ago. If anyone would like to see the proceedings of it, I have it here. You'll see some interesting people in it. And uh, also, if you want to see the first Blueberry Harvester that was built in Emil Perdick's backyard that looks very similar to not too old of ones, I have that on the computer too. So, and talk a little bit about mechanical harvesting of uh, my thoughts on, uh, when I consider mechanical harvesting, I say number one is the germplasm. Some will, some you'll never mechanical harvest and other ones are pretty good. So, okay, so much for the, uh, we'll go to our panel now. Uh, Questions for the panel? Well, I have one to start with. Uh, David, are you familiar with any resolution that would help on uh, the trap in able to, uh, he's looking at a very small insect. The spotted wing Drosophila would be great to be able to look at on, uh, or be able to use, and uh, he needs more resolution in order to identify the, the spotted wing Drosophila. Uh, you you want to come up here? Or. Uh, so resolution is a function of a couple of things: distance off target, um, four optic lens that you have on there, and the other thing is the number of spatial pixels that you kind of stick in the scene. Those are a lot of variables. So are we talking about your trap? Uh, for this exp uh, thought experiment, yeah, let's go with that one. <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure I can help you on that one. <laughs> you, know, part, you know, it's just interesting that so much of the, the cost of the instrument is, is really enhanced or increased by kind of the quality of the four optic there. Mm -hmm. Again, the cost of the instrument is, is really impacted by the number of spatial pixels that you're putting into the scene. So I'm sure you get much higher resolution, but you're sitting there trying to balance cost versus uh, detection ability. Right, and that's why I said that I think, that's why I said that I think that we will eventually get there. It's just a matter of time so that we can get the cost at a reasonable price point. Any other questions? 
Well, let's give the panel like a good hand. I'll turn it back over to Rod. All right, we're wearing you out, obviously. All right. We are on to the last panel. We will, uh, we're a little behind, so we'll speed this thing up. Um, as I mentioned when we came back from lunch, uh, these are all really exciting things. We've had some great feedback at the break time. A lot of people were talking about a lot of the cool ideas here. So it's obviously time to throw that bucket of ice water over us all uh, because somehow it needs to be funded. So how does an industry go about funding some of these things? Uh, as I said, the panel itself, the committee itself, really started with the concept that, gosh, we were going to go figure out how to, how to afford to help the mechanical harvesting firms invest in machines. And that, didn't, that, that wasn't the direction we headed in. And I, I, in the next panel, we're going to find out a little bit, I think, about why but, and how that doesn't work out financially but also a little bit about how the strawberry industry has addressed this issue as well. And again, mostly just to give thoughts about moving forward. Uh, the takeaway from this meeting is there's lots of things out there. Uh, it does need to be funded if, if we're going to advance into the technology world. And uh, with that, I will introduce our first uh, panel person. I have Greg Hennefeld. Uh, he's actually listed in your program from an investment firm, Aegis. He's actually an advisor to that uh, firm. Um, he is by birth a farmer, raised on a corn, soybean farm, row crops and such. But he has been in the investment world and the banking world for most of his career. Uh, over $3 billion in total amounts of uh, investment funds he's brought forward through a lot of different organizations, banks, uh, private investment firms, equity firms. And he's got a little bit of mathematics he's going to work through us, for, through for us, and uh, get, the, get the discussion going. So, with Greg, you want... So uh, when I left the farm, my, uh, I think my father, his uh, workers' comp claims went down and his liability insurance went down at the same rate. Uh, so uh, go from there. And uh, in terms of presentation, if you think back to one of those Saturday Night Live uh, skits where the, the people, all of a sudden you see the people go, wah, wah, wah. Uh, hopefully that's not me. But thanks for your time and your indulgence. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, providing an overview of institutional capital for you folks. Uh, and if it's redundant for some of you, my apologies. Uh, talk a little bit about a summary of the lifestyle or continuum of capital and returns that people are looking for from an institutional standpoint. And then this is, you, you can take, uh, you throw, throw, take pot shots and throw tomatoes at the end, but I took a stab at an assessment of the uh, harvester market for the blueberry industry. And from a uh, market sizing standpoint and then a profitability standpoint, just to kind of put, provide some perspective and some thought for how you folks will want to or think about funding the industry going forward as we see increasing labor rates, particularly in the West Coast, but everywhere. Um, clicker, there we go. First tab, uh, investment continuum. Institutional investors come across buckets. If you think about, I think there's a, particularly in agriculture, there's a culture of capital. Uh, and as a banker I've, and as an investor, I've seen the misalignments of investment partners, be it a banker or not, uh, have ruined families, family businesses. And it, it's been heartbreaking by folks that are misaligned with the cycle, the volatility, or the structure. Venture capital is made up of angel investors, seed stage, as I, as I walk through this, focus on the bottom for a second uh, as I'm talking, because this gives you an idea of where those people play and what they're looking for from a return standpoint. If you can't see in the back, the yellow line is investment dollars. The bottom line is, is uh, the x-axis is timeline. The red line is theoretical sales of a business. And the green line is the amount of risk that an investor is taking in that life cycle. So venture capital, angel, 
maybe family offices, rich folks putting money behind it. It's basically an idea. Uh, seed stage early rounds, which tend to be A, B, C, and D rounds in investment vernacular as companies get closer and closer to commercialization. Uh, as, an ex uh, as an example, I don't know how many guys, how many of you folks know Farmers Business Network that was mentioned earlier. They just closed a hundred and I think it was a hundred and ten million dollar D round. And uh, uh, as they start to stuff their pipe with product and uh, create a commercially viable and scalable business. Uh, later stage VC, which would be the D round minority investments. Uh, growth equity are businesses that their product is now commercialized and they're starting to accelerate in the market. Um, recapitalizations, companies that are already making money and so they go out and borrow money and take the equity out of it. That's what money guys kind of do. Um, and then uh, buyouts and LBOs. So you get to a point where if you've got a family transition, ownership change, uh, look at Monsanto being bought out. Someone else thinks that they can buy it and make and create create value with it. And Monsanto, when you look at its, its uh, uh, history and investment timeline, uh, it really grew rapidly with the uh, advent of technology and uh, genetically modified organisms and their applications. This slide, I just want to put a snapshot up. Uh, it's basically the, it, the uh, global investment in food and ag by institutional capital. Um, and if you look at some of those things, farmlands tripled in 10 years. Private equities quad, quintupled in 10 years. Venture capital has increased six times in 10 years and doubled in the last five. Uh, water entitlements have tripled. Um, and if you look at the bottom, there's a Valoral Advisors. It's a guy out of Spain who puts this book together. You can go online. It's a great overview of uh, in global investment in, uh, in agriculture today. But I thought the, the picture told, said a thousand words, and I thought I'd put it up real quick. Uh, this is the investment continuum I talked about, where I said talked about angel, angel venture growth buyouts and so forth. Um, in fact, you know what? I'm just going to flip it to the next pit, next one. When we talk about technology today, and if you look, if you think through, we had uh, uh, three folks in autonomous farming equipment. We had two companies in sensing technology, two companies in uh, that are going to follow me that are have, are vertically integrated in terms of investing while they're in the uh, grower packer shipper model. Uh, we had nine companies that are harvesters. And we had five on the list in optical sorting that became four literally today, um, which is kind of cool. The company at the bottom, I think, is out of Norway and very focused in technology, so you folks should benefit from that. When you look at returns, angel, venture, growth, those are, if you go back and think about that risk picture that I had up there, a lot of risk. I think one of the, when I talked about the culture of capital, if you look at the first row below the blue one, the company age or asset life. Angel, venture, growth, they're in it, and particularly angel and venture and growth, typically they want to be in it for one to five years and they flip out uh, to another investor that can take it to the next level. Now, if you look at those first four columns and look at the bottom, angel investors are looking for around a nine times cash on cash return in three years, 70% IRR. Uh, and as that risk goes down, the returns go down uh, commensurately, but still. Uh, I, I talked to uh, a, a firm that does uh, early stage venture investing, and they're, the, way they, the way they described it, and whether it's right or wrong, is they're hoping that they'll have one, t one or two 10x returns, uh, a handful of 5x returns, and then they'll have three that are busts. So they're looking at a portfolio. And these things, you can, if you search Google, you can find similar slides. Um, as you move down the spectrum, the returns go down. Private equity, three to five and a half times in five years. Buyouts, three to four times, because they're more mature companies. Private equity typically is looking for growth or to cut costs. Uh, I, put, I added real assets and real and long-term assets infrastructure investing. Those assets are long. That's your life. That's your lifeblood. That's my father's farm that I grew up on. Uh, I'm never going to sell. And so, from an investment standpoint, does the return matter? 
No, it's just like we can't put as much leverage on it because of the volatility that we have in our industry. So that gives you an idea of returns across the spectrum. Um, most of them are private. Uh, farmland, 8 to 15% return targets for an investor, maybe a little less. Uh, estimated return expectations for an angel investor, 70%. Farmland is like a secured bond. If you own a bond, you get to clip the coupon. For our corn farm in uh, Illinois, we have cash rent. And over the last, since 1970, farmland has outperformed the Standard & Poor's Index with less volatility. That's one that uh, you can take to your Wall Street buddies. Um, okay, so now I get to the wah, wah, wah part. Um, yeah, I'm going to go back there for a second. So how, how is an investor going to get those kinds of returns today in agriculture? Um, it's, it's tough. How, if you think about the volatility that we live in today in ag, uh, that's where I come back to the culture of capital in agriculture. If you're going to have a partner, if it's your banker, if it's, a, if it's an investor, you want to line them up both from a intellectual, a philosophical, and integrity standpoint, but you also want to understand how long they want to invest in your business or give you access to their land and make sure that that lines up from a return standpoint and a risk-sharing standpoint. Uh, the closer you get to Wall Street, in my experience in, the, in our industry, uh, the less alignment there is. Um, so, And for fun, I looked at the harvester industry, and my math's wrong. I'll, I admit it. Somewhere it's wrong. But I'll walk you through the methodology, because the outcome is to, to really help you guys focus a little bit about uh, how to work with or how, you, how to create capital or access capital for technology investment in your industry. I took the number of acres harvested in the blueberry industry in North America. I assumed half of it was machine harvest. I assumed two, two assumptions, just to show the difference, that one machine is going to harvest anywhere between 75 or 150 acres. And I used a high number on the 150. I assume it's high just because I think the industry is consolidating. Um, and, uh, and one of the firms that I actually uh, work with, I work with a, a private equity firm that manages about, I advise, I'm an advisor to a private equity firm that manages about $7 billion investing in technology-enabled business service companies. Agus Capital, which is a investor in farmland and permanent crops and vertically integrated agribusiness companies. So. Uh, with uh, out of Boston and other parts of the country. And then a uh, venture fund that's out of Kansas City that invests in animal and plant biosciences primarily. Um, so a little background in that. And, and also, I've probably been on a handful of blueberry farms. When you go down from uh, the acres harvested, 50% machine harvest, the average machine of 70 to 150, uh, Institutional capital coming in and consolidating is part of that. Uh, machines required for North America. Well, uh, if you take the number of acres, 50% of that divided by 75 or 150, you end up with 1,000 acres, 1,000 machines or 541 machines. If a machine lasts 15 years, the replacement market on an annual basis is either 72 or 36 machines. Again, these are wrong, I'm sure, just based on the numbers I've heard today, but it gives you some context to think about this. Now, at an average cost of machine of $175,000, that means that the annual North American replacement market for blueberry harvesting machines is somewhere between six and $12 million. Machine companies typically, if they're making heavy equipment, unless they're branded like John Deere, um, or if they're using a ton of technology like say, Unitech or a color sorting business that uh, typically have around 10 to 15 percent EBITDA margins. So you're, the whole industry, if my math is even close to correct, is somewhere of profit uh, before interest and depreciation and taxes is somewhere between 1.3 and $600,000. Now, whether I'm right or wrong, who knows? What does that, what does that leave, it, leave it with? Well, we'll if you go back and think about the page before, will an institutional investor get excited about investing in the blueberry machine harvesting industry? I don't think so. Uh, institutional investors looking for scalability, high margin, 
And once they can get to scale, they're looking to exit. Uh, so where, do, where does the technology come from? Where does the money come from? And uh, uh, you know what I've seen today in thinking about this a little bit, it's got to come from the industry. It's got to come from companies like we saw today that are also making different machines for different industries. So they're taking uh, their, their engineers and their research and development overhead and spreading it across uh, more assets and more sales and allocating their, their uh, R&D's time to wherever there's an opportunity, where they have the highest and best return. Um, so I, I leave you with that. I think that, you know, a couple of things that I thought about as, a, uh, as an ag guy, in our industry, things don't work in this unless there's alignment. So I think going back to the Chicago Mercantile Exchange where you have cash settled trading, things get arbed out in our industry way too fast. Uh, inefficiencies do. And so are there opportunities for growers to take a little cash, put it aside, create a fund to invest in early stage technologies in the harvesting space and the technology space? to get it off the ground so that someone else can pick it up once it gets to a certain level and bring it to market? Are there partnerships with, between growers and technology companies or growers and, and harvesting companies that can uh, help get things to market faster? Because uh, with the increasing labor, that the, uh, the return on investment becomes, for, for you, maybe higher than for them. Thanks. told you we'd have a bucket of ice water for you. So <clears throat> Greg did, a, uh, I think, a very interesting job of kind of setting up what the private equity institutions uh, look at and look like from their willingness to invest to help us out. And for that reason, we've got the next two people on the program to talk a little bit about how the strawberry industry has worked on trying to find harvesting systems. I mentioned that we are a lucky, <clears throat> excuse me, industry in the fact that we actually have mechanical harvesters in the first place. Strawberry industry, not so much if you don't um, count the one machine that they had in Michigan when I was growing up, which basically was almost like a, a subplow that plowed, literally plowed up the entire field, picked the entire matted row strawberries up and kind of sorted the mess out at the end, but it, it didn't make very nice fresh market strawberries. That was sort of a joke, but okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, George. Uh, <laughs> I'll give you your five bucks later. Um, so next on the program, uh, we have Michael uh, Christensen. He does work for Driscoll as their uh, director of uh, global R&D and, and technical services. Uh, Driscoll's been very aggressive, as you can imagine, being a, a very, very large strawberry firm and looking for a lot of technical solutions for a lot of their issues, uh, harvest being one of those. And so I've asked him to come, not to really tell us what Driscoll's particularly doing, but uh, obviously part of his job is to go around the world and look at what is happening. And so I believe he's going to share a little bit with us about some of the things he's seen and uh, ways that uh, some investment is taking place in the new technologies in the strawberry industry. So Michael. Good afternoon. I'm, I'm uh, very sensitive to the fact that I'm the second to last speaker, so I only have three slides for you. Um, so I'll start with a little bit of context, though. So we've been um, involved in the, the sort of search for solutions for harvesting strawberries for five or six years now. Um, and back when we started, there were one or two companies out there working in this space. Today, we're tracking six companies globally who are active in developing robotic, uh, robotic solutions. And there's another four or five sort of waiting in the wings that are telling us they're about to get in. So the space has gotten very active over the last few years. It's really encouraging. So because of that, we spend a lot of time interacting with uh, startup folks. And, and more recently, we're interacting more with some of the more incumbents in the, in the blueberry space or the harvester incumbents. Um, and we also spend some time around uh, some of the financing folks to understand sort of their perspective. And Greg's talk was really, really insightful, I thought. Um, so, I, um, I think the, the approach we've taken, we've come to understand over the last years is if we want solutions in our market, 
And strawberries are not a lot different than blueberries in terms of the size of the market. We're, strawberries are actually a fair bit smaller. But if we want solutions, we have to be engaged. They're not just going to sort of parachute in for us in terms of technologists and financiers sort of doing the heavy lifting and, sh and landing on our doorstep with, with really good solutions. We have to be engaged if we want these solutions. So I, I found this somewhere. I can't remember where I saw it, but I thought it was really good. This, this notion of the, these sort of three constituents that you need, sort of three ingredients you need if you're going to have successful technology development. You need somebody who needs a problem solved. And, and in our case, in production ag, especially the labor-intensive ag, we have this burning platform of the need for labor demand reduction. You need funders, and you need technology developers. So just a couple comments about those. I mean, we heard a really good perspective from the prior speaker on sort of where the institutional funders are coming from. The good news is there's a lot of technology uh, developers coming into agriculture. It's really amazing. I mean, you've probably all experienced it over your career, sort of the, the kind of people that approached you 20 years ago and the kind of people that approach you today, what they're working on and what their credentials are. It's quite amazing the, the number of talented people coming towards agriculture. Um, and we're going to benefit from it. It's going to really change our industry over the, over the coming, coming years. So we, it, it's become really clear, uh, as, as has been mentioned, the, the, um, the funding is not, our, our needs are not necessarily really good fits for venture capital, the, the, as was described. And so what I wanted to lay out for you here is this a spectrum of, there's both financing involved here, but also just engagement, and particularly with startups, but also even with the incumbents, the more established companies. I wanted to lay out a, sort of a, a spectrum of ways that any of any one of us might engage with these the folks developing technology and sort of how these might be structured. Over the last in the course of my career, I've been involved essentially in every every one of these types of models, and I'll just touch on the sort of the, the variations on the models, sort of from left to right. Left being the the least expensive and least time consuming for you, and the far right being the, the opposite of that: more expensive, more risk, uh, more time consuming. But on the far left, particularly with startups, uh, the information you have about your business is very valuable to startups. And if you've watched it over time, the, the startup founders have become quite a bit more astute at coming and asking questions. There's this whole movement called Lean Startup you may have heard of, but a lot of startup founders practice those principles now, and they come and ask you lots of questions, and they do quite a good job of understanding your needs as opposed to sort of uh, imposing their solution on you. So just engaging in information sharing as an industry expert that the folks in the room are, you can really contribute to the advancement of this work. As we move across, uh, a really common thing, we do a lot of this. It's really simple, it doesn't really cost you any money. Just grant access to your field for testing. You know, just carve off a little piece of the field. There's a little bit of risk, maybe that you have some crop damage or something, but again, testing space, test environments are really valuable really for any development in ag because you know it's you, you can't really test technology right in the operational space. I mean, you've probably all tinkered with that, particularly harvest. It gets really messy if you're trying to deploy new technology into a sort of a live commercial harvest operation. Uh, moving across, you start to hear the folks using Lean Startup, they start to talk about paid pilots. That's becoming more and more common as their product gets closer to commercial reality. Sort of a pre a pre step to that would be that they would want to come to a, a paid pilot on a small scale, and it's just about building trust, creating a relationship, generating a little bit of revenue for them. On our side, it's it's expressing by paying for the pilot, you're expressing that you're willing to put skin in the game. So we're starting to hear startups uh, uh, approach us with that. And now as we go right, it gets a little more intense, and, and, and typically the, the numbers involved will get bigger and the sort of the, the, legal, the legalese involved will get a little more complex. But the next one over is commercial rights. And so this is really just helping fund the development, whether it's an incumbent, an established company, or a startup, but folks on our side of the table helping fund the advancement of the work but not necessarily wanting to get involved in an equity transaction or being a part owner of an LLC. Or it's, it's sort of staying in your core business and just expressing your interest in the, in the outcome of the technology that it creates. So we've been involved in a few of these, and they, they work quite well. The, 
the agreements can be relatively simple, but typically you're asking for preferred pricing. You might be asking for exclusivity for a period of time. Um, uh, what else is preferred pricing exclusivity? Um, sometimes there's royalty agreements where, hey, we'll fund the, we'll help fund the development of the technology, but we're going to want a, a royalty to earn a return um, on on this initial investment. So we're going to want a royalty on the sale of the future technology. Um, those can work pretty well. The next one over, convertible debt, very common in Silicon Valley these days. Uh, also, the not terribly complicated in terms of how much you have to pay your lawyers to write these things up, but essentially you're, you're putting some money into the development, you're doing it in the form of a loan, and later on uh, when the uh, convertible debt matures, you can either um, convert to equity or the debt can be repaid. Um, We've been involved in these as well. Uh, they can work pretty well. I mean, I think the accountants in the room, uh, they write that debt off the moment we sort of sign the check, but that's, that's their job to be conservative. But, so you're not necessarily counting on getting a loan repayment, but you're trying to help move the, uh, you know, move the uh, technology forward. The next one over is an equity investment. The, the folks from Harvest Crew will talk about that. Um, they're an example of a, a startup who's done a really good job of being very organized and coming with a very nicely packaged uh, approach for the growers to uh, decide if they want to uh, participate from an equity standpoint. So equity can work. It's complicated, though, and um, you have to, the, the comments about alignment were very well taken. You, you have to really be sure that you can align, and you have to be really clear at the outset, sort of, as a minority equity holder, what, how are you going to play in this? How are you going to play relative to the founders and future investors as a minority equity holder? It sounds sort of appealing and sort of sexy. Hey, we're going to be equity investors, but it, you have to really be sure that you want to go there because it, it gets more complicated and the outcomes aren't aren't uh, always as clear. And then the last one on the far right there is uh, uh, outsourcing. That's really where whether you as a company or you and some of your industry peers decide we really need to move something forward, there's no startups in the space, the incumbents don't wanna work on it, it's just you saying we're gonna go pay a technology developer to move this forward or we're gonna pay an incumbent to move it forward. Um, we're doing a little bit of that. We've done some of it in companies, sort of technology companies outside of agriculture but who have an interest in coming into agriculture and it, it can be expensive but, but you, um, we've, we're finding sort of predictability uh, and um, sort of broad expertise in some of these outside technology firms where they don't necessarily know agriculture, but they know a lot of other spaces, and they're bringing what they know from those spaces into agriculture, and we're finding some benefit there. Um, and on that far right one, as I mentioned, you know, it's really clear to us, we don't, we don't necessarily want to do this work alone, and so... Um, pretty much every project we bring forward now, a, a question we get from our leadership is, well, which partners have you talked to and who's, who else wants to come to the table to be a part of this? So um, we sort of look closer within our own sort of domain of closely aligned companies and then we'll work our way out to other, you know, broader parts of the industry depending on sort of how much money it takes and, um, you know, sort of who wants to be involved. But these problems like harvest automation, they're expensive and long lead time, so we, we shouldn't try and solve them ourselves for sure. Last but not least, I think the, the most important thing is for everybody in, in a great forum and great job to Rod and the team today, the, the, the message for me is get involved in some way, whether it's information sharing or, or writing a big check as an equity investor, get involved somehow because uh, we have to move this stuff forward if we want these solutions. So thank you. All right, the speaker some of you have been waiting for for a while now. Um, <laughs> sorry, Paul. Uh, Paul Bissett is with um, Harvest Crew. This is a firm that was developed initially by Wish Farms. For those who aren't familiar with Wish Farms, they're a very large, uh, highly successful uh, strawberry operation out of Florida. They also are a blueberry grower and a, a member of uh, both NABC, USHBC. Uh, Paul's come to them with a, a long career in both Wall Street, but he has also been very entrepreneurial. He's uh, done several startups and sold out to 
really impressive companies. I'd read a few of them, but I think I have to pass the security test first before I can even name them. Um, heavily involved in uh, naval oceanography and a, a number of tech firms as well. So although he's here kind of to talk to Harvest Crew and, and to expand on what Michael gave a great uh, intro to as well, um, He's got a lot of the entrepreneurial spirit as well. He really knows high tech as, as uh, well. So I think it's very enjoyable to have him come. So Paul, please join us. Thank you. Um, I, I hope I can live up to that introduction. That was awesome. Uh, I, I, I've had a long career in technology um, and, and optical sensing and cloud computing. But I got to be honest with you, these days, I'm a berry farmer, and I, I love it. Um, I was always a, a, a heavy eater of berries. I think uh, the family puts away at least two pounds of berries a week, of blueberries a week, and more of strawberries. So I'm, I'm enjoying myself in this new endeavor. I'm the new COO of Harvest Crew, um, brought on by Gary to help um, take us to the next phase of our development. And with that, um, let me start you off here. The sweetest strawberries in the world. But if you aren't able to pick them, no one will ever be able to enjoy them. The labor issue is really taking the fun out of farming. It's, uh, it's just added to one of the great many amount of variables that's in the business. And um, it's uncertain from day to day who's going to, you know, if you're going to be able to get the fruit harvested or not. It'd be good to have a good, you know, dependable way to get the fruit harvested and not have to worry about it, you know. Each year, strawberry farmers struggle to find workers. At the same time, over 30% of a strawberry farm's annual budget is spent on harvest labor costs, and the cost of labor continues to rise each year. U.S. strawberry growers are spending close to a billion dollars a year on harvest labor. While the cost of labor increases, the labor pool is decreasing, making it difficult to find qualified people. Because strawberries must be picked on a very strict harvest schedule, the lack of labor has become a huge issue for strawberry farmers. Founded in 2013, Harvest Crew Robotics plans to solve the labor issues facing the strawberry industry. A collaborative effort with more than 20% of the U.S. strawberry industry invested to date, Harvest Crew Robotics has experts in agriculture, engineering, robotics, machine vision, and laser sensing technology working together to develop a fully autonomous robotic berry picker. In addition to helping farmers solve their labor problem, the Harvest Crew Robotic Berry Picker will save money, increase yields, reduce energy usage, and improve quality. Because strawberries ripen at different times, fields need to be picked about every three days. Otherwise, ripe fruit will become overripe and have to be thrown away. The average commercial field gets picked about 40 times during the harvest season. The Harvest Crew Robotic Berry Picker will save farmers money by reducing the per box harvest cost. Because farmers can lease the picker, their cost will be less than what they typically pay in labor costs while ensuring that the crop will be picked on time. Also, farmers will not have to worry about extra labor costs such as benefits and overtime. With the Harvest Crew Robotic Berry Picker, farm yield will not be limited to the number of workers available. Growers will be able to harvest their entire crop. With the Harvest Crew Robotic Berry Picker, farmers will have labor when they need it most. The robots will pick berries when they're at their optimum ripeness during the coolest part of the day. The machines will be able to pick during the weekend, which will allow growers to stay on a strict harvest schedule. Because the Robotic Berry Picker can pick the berries during the cooler parts of the day and night, farmers will be able to reduce their energy usage and can increase the acreage planted without adding more cooling facilities. Also, because berries are packed directly into consumer units and weighed, there is no need to worry about under or overpacking of consumer units. Reducing overpacks will contribute to increased yields. Unlike other robotic berry pickers under development, farmers will not have to change the way they plant their fields. The Harvest Crew Robotic Strawberry Picker uses GPS and LiDAR technology to precisely position the machine over plants. Using StereoVision, it finds and picks only the ripe strawberries. Thanks to the GPS technology, 
The robotic picker will be able to collect data on each plant as it moves through the field, tracking which plants have the highest yield, forecast future yields, and scout for disease and pest issues. More than 30% of the annual budget for a strawberry farm is spent on harvest labor costs. Last year, farmers spent close to a billion dollars. But as every farmer knows, while labor costs increase each year, the labor pool decreases, making it difficult to find people who are qualified to pick strawberries. And that leaves some farmers watching their hard work rot on the bush. At Harvest Crew Robotics, we want to help farmers realize the full yield from their crops and put the fun back in farming. So, um, when we bring up the presentation, that putting the fun back in farming is part of Gary's whole mantra. He's not having a whole lot of fun these days with respect to labor in the fields. Uh, it is the number one problem that we have in terms of picking strawberries. And it, it really, I think in this case, is why cooperation or cooperation in the strawberry industry is actually working. Um, labor is an existential threat to the industry. Um, one of the little factoids that I picked up today is that there's been automation aids in the blueberry industry since 1987. That's nearly 30 years of increasing automation, which has allowed the blueberry industry a little more flexibility in terms of how it deals with the labor problem. In, um, in strawberries, we, we, we have nothing. Literally, the, the same process that you see today in the strawberry fields was done 100 years ago. Okay, and it's backbreaking work. And not only do we suffer the challenges of everybody else in terms of acquiring labor, but at peak harvest times during the year, when other crops are coming in, the labor that we have will leave. They'll actually leave for less because it's easier to stand up and pick grapes versus actually bending over and collecting trays of strawberries and then running them back to the pallet and then running back into the field. So strawberries, for strawberries, um, labor is an existential threat to the industry, and the industry is coming together to try to find those solutions. And just to give you an idea of, of how much of an existential threat, um, most of the migrant labor pools that were seen in the United States for farming all came of age when the, the fertility rates were around six, seven um, in Mexico. These days, they're now um, tracking U.S. fertility rates. So the population just is not there. Demographics is just not there to come support the migrant pools. And in fact, this is based on um, some Pew research uh, that was done between uh, 2007 and 2014. It's, it's not only that they're not there and they're not coming, they're actually turning away and going back home. Okay, so we've lost in that period of time, 2007, 2014, about 1.1 million migrant workers, both documented and undocumented, just went back home. Okay, so that's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a devastating effect onto the labor rates in our field. Labor rates in the last couple of years are tracking 10, 20% increasing each year. That's if you can find the populations to, to harvest. Um, total acreage is down 30%. You might know better than I um, in, in California since 2013. And during those peak rates, millions of dollars of crops are, loft, are left, in the, um, left in the fields just from not being able to pick. So um, the slide, and, and I apologize for that video, it hasn't been updated. Uh, it's not 20% of the production in the strawberry industry that are now um, cooperating with us, investors in our company. It's up to 66%. Um, so the industry, and it's not just us, as, as Michael was saying, um, they're actually investing in a number of companies, and to which I would say, because I like strawberries, um, please do. The, the challenge isn't just for our field, it is for the whole $20 billion specialty fruits and vegetables industry. So uh, quickly, the early adopter program, which was one of the things that Gary came up, he is a farmer, he came up with these ideas to try to save his industry. Um, investors receive priority for any harvesting services or harvesters that we come to market with. And it, that prioritization is based on how much they invest and when they actually got into the company. And there's a prioritization um, allocation cycle, meaning that 
the guy at the top with the most priority doesn't get all the harvesters till they're saturated. What happens is, is there's, a, there's a, um, a cycle through such that everybody who's an investor gets something and we keep cycling through until we've either um, depleted all of the harvesting services we have at that period of time or they're completely satisfied and then we'll be able to um, go out to outside uh, customers. Uh, there is a three-year discount off of retail pricing that will be offered to all of these investors for any additional services beyond the, the harvesters themselves. And like I said, investors need to be satisfied before any non-investor cus customers can be um, sold to. H here's the reason why I really jumped into this business and I'm highly focused on it and I hope that others in the industry, including the financial services industry, will be too. This is um, Gary's dad back in the 60s. Uh, that box of strawberry um, sold in New York City at prices that are 100 plus dollars a tray today. Okay, today's trays are about 10 bucks, sometimes a little less at peak harvest. If we don't solve the problem, this is what we're going back to. Okay, they, it, it will track back to these prices because we just won't have the abilities to get them off the ground. So with that, I'm done. Thanks. Oh, I, I did just want to say engagement. That was an awesome point, not that I'm sucking up to you, but um, it's true that the biggest challenges to startups is getting information and engagement with customers. So if you have the opportunity, somebody's asking you questions, sit down with them. It costs you nothing but time, but you may learn something, and they will certainly learn a ton. Thanks. Fantastic. Thanks, Paul. I'll just stay here. I know it is the last speaker of the day. I know it's been a long day, and I know you're tired, but we've got experts here. Uh, are there questions for our panel? We'll bring all three fellows forward if there are. There are some questions. Yeah, Tom. Uh, Tom Bodke from Michigan. Um, this would be for probably both Paul and Michael. Um, just as, as uh, grower marketers, how do you assure that uh, the, I know you're, you're trying to just get the crop harvested. That's the main goal. But along with that, at a, at a more reasonable cost per pound of production, uh, you're going to gain better margins. But as grower marketers, how do you assure that those margins don't end up at the retailer and, like growers typically do, end up giving away all their gained margins? <laughs> well, I think we're beyond my uh, expertise. I, um, I, I, I guess what I can say is we're watching really closely. There's a lot of assumptions. We're, we're modeling the economics of the technology really closely, and it's early days because the models are full of assumptions that have yet to be validated. Um, so I, I'm not going to answer your question very directly. What I can say is we can see um, pretty clearly um, sort of marginal cost advantages with robotics. We think robotics are within a couple years in strawberries. Like we think in the early 2020s, they'll start to ramp up. And we think in the early days, we can already see a cost advantage, We're probably starting at about 10% and going up over time. So how to keep that on the grower side, that's probably outside of my expertise, but we can see the advantage there now, just sort of hand harvest versus machine harvest. Uh, and is, as long as the model, the assumptions validate in the models. So one of the things that we're doing um, is going through the whole customer discovery process, which is part of the, the lean startup um, activities that Michael had mentioned. And one of the things that we discovered is that packaging itself adds a lot of volume to the trays and the pallets. Uh, and that volume with a standard um, eight or, or six down um, pallet, um, it's not it's not weight that's driving the shipping cost, it's volume. And if we can devise as part of this automated harvesting process a new packaging scheme that allows us to get more trays on a pallet, we can reduce shipping cost per unit sales um, quite substantially, almost by half. Now that, in the typical tray for uh, strawberry growers, it's about 25 cents a tray that goes to the, to the um, grower's pocket, but if we can increase the shipping weight of a pallet, there's an extra probably 12 cents in there 
for the grower. Now, whether the grower gets to keep it or he loses it in the negotiations of the retailer, that's beyond what we can do. So, but there might be an extra 12 cents there. So. What, um, what Paul's shown on the group getting together in the strawberry deal, and of course most of that um, first slide is, is a lot of the marketers as well as tech companies, but there are several uh, operations out there. Agrobot, uh, if you go out and do a YouTube on Agrobot, it's another strawberry picker, came out of Spain originally, but it's been highly um, worked on now in uh, California for three or four years. Six years. Six years, okay. Uh, six years, and it's um, it kind of looks like a walking spider with arms that go up and down. It's very weird, but um, it does require a totally different kind of growing system. And for that kind of reason, again, this is a, a project where many of the strawberry marketers have come together and simply said, you know, the tipping point is one firm can't afford to try and take on that sort of technology cost. And so they have been able to find ways to really gather together. And I think that's very impressive, the strawberry deal, so. Nothing else? Fantastic. Well, I'd, I'd like to uh, thank the panel again. Please uh, give them your thanks. So you mentioned uh, before a lot of the, the purpose of the afternoon was really to kind of throw out a lot of ideas, a lot of thoughts, and have you meditate on those a bit. Usually, if we were a good extension program here, we would have a questionnaire to find out what you learned and what you liked. Uh, unfortunately, my father, who's probably rolling over in his grave being a good extension agent, I did not have a questionnaire put together for today. I seem to have a few other things that were priorities. But any of you who, uh, who we have your emails and we know you are registered, we will be doing a follow-up questionnaire in the next week or so, because. It's important that we get some feedback. We need to know what you liked, what you didn't like, what you found of value, what you didn't, and perhaps it's even better if we don't do it today, but we give you a chance to think about it. So I'd like to personally thank you all for attending. The, uh, the attendance was outstanding. This is our, our first um, go at this. It seems to have been successful. I know we've got tracking numbers on uh, people who are live streaming as well, and uh, just like to thank you and put one last plug in to growers who are not uh, part of North American Blueberry Council, um, it's really an important organization to pay into. It is uh, not a voluntary, involuntary thing like USHBC. It is totally voluntary. And I would also encourage any of the firms that we're here presenting today, the mechanical harvesting firms, the optical sorters, and others, uh, you can be an associate member. I'm a consulting firm personally, and I'm an associate member. It gives me access both to the growers, the knowledge of the growers, as well as a lot of the statistics and other data that NABC collects that is not available through U.S. Highbush Blueberry Council, which is a public organization. So uh, take that with you as well, and uh, thank you very much for coming.